Yuma, good evening everybody and welcome here to the Australian National University and to the Order of Australia Lecture this evening. Uh, my name is Janino Flynn. I'm the director of the Crawford School of Public Policy here at the Australian National University. We're meeting here this evening in Canberra on the beautiful lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, where across the millennia people have joined together here to share stories and build knowledge, to listen and learn and to pass on that knowledge across the generations. It's in this tradition of sharing stories and building knowledge that I'm very pleased to open the event this evening. I'd also like to take this opportunity to pay my respects to the elders past and present and to acknowledge any First Nations colleagues who are here with us this evening and to express my hope that together we can continue the work of forging a brighter future together. Tonight is a special night for many reasons. It's an opportunity for us to come together to acknowledge the important contributions of our colleagues and to celebrate them. The annual Order of Australia, um, sorry, the annual Order of Australia, Australian National University Lecture was established in 2010 to do just that. It is now into its 15th year and has showcased distinguished scholars from across the ANU, some of who I have seen here in the room tonight. And tonight we will continue this tradition and hear from another of our esteemed colleagues. It's wonderful to have with us tonight members of the ACT Order of Australia Association, and I'd especially like to acknowledge the chair, Mr. Andrew Phelan, AM. Uh, Mr. Phelan will join um, Professor Lahari Dutt after her lecture for the question and answer part of the evening. Uh, just give me a moment to introduce Andrew now, because that will stop us from doing the up and down <laughs> all through the proceedings. Uh, he was the Chief Executive and Principal Registrar of the High Court of Australia from 2007 until his retirement in 2018. In the two decades prior to his appointment to that office, Andrew held numerous Commonwealth senior executive law enforcement, court administrative, legal, international and general management positions. I thank you very much for being here today and for your support. I mentioned in my opening remarks that this is a special evening for many reasons, um, and for me, as the director of the Crawford School of Public Policy, it is especially so. Tonight, the lecture will be delivered by one of my wonderful colleagues from the school, Professor Kuntala Lahiri Dutt, AO. Um, Dutt, sorry, I'm doing my pronunciations incorrectly today. It's been a long day for me today. Apologies, Kuntala. And she'll speak on the topic of a possible world, transforming gender relations for sustainability. In her lecture tonight, Kuntala will argue that to address the challenges of sustainability, we must prioritise gendered livelihoods and create a world that is both sustainable and gender equitable. She will explore themes of gender equality, social justice and sustainability, which have been woven throughout her extraordinary academic career. Her story is an inspirational and impactful one. As a child, she was captivated by colour and music and imagined a future at art college. By chance, and there is a much longer story here, she ended up studying geography. And whilst part of this was to satisfy her incredible wanderlust, it laid the foundation for a future that she may not have ever foreseen all those years ago as that young girl. What followed were years of travel observing, listening, learning and understanding the world of natural resource management, but also finding a space dominated by men and their stories, but yet reliant on the unrecognised and invisible work of women. Over many years, Kuntala has carried these ideas through her research and in her advisory work. On this journey, she has made the invisible visible to all of us, and in doing so, has developed into an internationally recognised scholar, and a fierce advocate of gender equality, not just in her research, but in her day-to-day -day life. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce her to deliver the Order of Australia Lecture for 2024, and please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Yumulundi, Yututung, hello. Daura Nuna, Daura Nunawal. Yangugulanin Nalawiri, Tunai Nunawal Daora Wanga Ralidijinin Marini Balang Bagarabang. This is Nanawal country. Today we are all meeting together on Nanawal country. We acknowledge and pay respect to the elders past and present. Thank you 
Mr. Andrew Phelan, for inviting me to deliver this year's Order of Australia oration. I would also like to thank the ANU and Professor Janine O'Flynn for hosting this event. Uh, today, I feel immensely privileged. Coming from India, it has been a very long journey for me to chart a research field in gender and natural resource management. The greatest part of that journey began in Australia when I joined the world's best colleagues at the Australian National University. Today, I say thank you to them for their collegiality, camaraderie, and love. A special thank you goes to my collaborators at ANU's Gender Institute, who made it possible for me to stand here today. I love you all. And to all of you, your presence here makes me feel humble, and I am grateful that you are sharing your time with me. At first glance, gender equality and a sustainable world for future generations might seem as incompatible as oil and water. Gender is in the niche domain of feminists, and scientists deal with the environment, resources, and sustainability. But I will show you that these two are deeply intertwined. A sustainable world is built on gender equality. Let me start with a story. This is the, I'm going to tell you the story of Mina. You're looking at her here. She's a woman who lives on a tiny island in a riverbed, on uh, the riverbed, in the riverbed in India. Her husband has left for work in a nearby town, and she manages the household, children, livestock, and a small agricultural plot that no longer offers the family subsistence as it did decades, <coughs> decades ago. Mina is one of the women who make up nearly 63% of workers in Indian agriculture, or 43% of farmers globally. A few decades ago, her work in the family farm would have been limited to transplantation of rice paddy and harvesting, helping out. But with increasing frequency, the multiple crises caused by unpredictable weather events high input costs, and lack of good market price have stifled the lives of smallholder farmers. Pushing men out of farm work, the depth of the agrarian crisis can be discerned from, among other indicators, farmers' suicides. Nearly 300,000 Farmers died this way between 1995 and 2014, but the pace has, pace has increased as only in the nine years between 2014 and 2022, over 1,000 farmers committed suicide. Mina was lucky that her husband migrated but didn't, uh, did not commit suicide. The result of this feminization of agriculture is that Mina and many women like her in other countries are doing work for which they had no training, using assets that they do not own, without being able to decide what crop to plant and where to sell or to control the incomes, and most importantly, without the ownership of the land that they till. With minor variations, the, this remains the case with smallholder farming around the majority world, where the oppressing structures of patriarchy have collaborated with policies that favor market expansion. Millions of women's lives are determined by two concurrent and broad processes. First, the economic reform programs 
that favor capitalist market expansion and incorporate rural and local environment in, and resource dependent communities into the global economy. And the second one is the rapid pace of environmental change. The impacts of these changes are gender and class selective. Let us see what feminist explanation could be developed to explain the lives of millions of women in less affluent countries like India. Women's struggles over the decades have borne fruit for women. Today, when we are supposed to be living in a post-feminist world, where many people tend to believe that the problem of gender inequality has been resolved, it is difficult to even think that it was only about 122 years ago that Australian women received their voting rights to be treated as political citizens for the first time. When Australia passed its Equal Opportunity Act in 1977, allowing women the right to choose to work in any field if they wish to, we can say that women were recognized as economic citizens. But women like Mina have been working all their lives, right? Their interests then became relegated to the field of uh, you know, what we know today as development. And women in more affluent nations became the torchbearers of what is known as a rights-based approach for women like Mina. A problem was that we never got around to seeing women as resource-using citizens and recast their political rights, citizenship, and the rights to livelihood and development as parts of one big whole. Another reason why the embracing of sustainable development and ensuring the security of women's livelihoods did not share the same platform is because of a Western biologically essentialist idea of women being inherently closer to nature. Some feminist philosophers argued that the domination of nature and the subjugation of women are interconnected, arising from the same logic of dualism that structures Western thought. This idea was then imperfectly superimposed on rural women in the majority world, like women like Mina. Interpreting women's enormous work burdens and substantial economic contributions to the majority world economies as their natural inclination is fundamentally problematic. Women whom you see here carrying their fuel wood have always, always been economic as well as resource-using citizens. I'm an academic, so I cannot escape a little bit of theory. <laughs> Over the last four or five decades, feminist approaches to women and gender in development have evolved. After the initial count to women in phase, the focus shifted to a more dynamic interpretation of gender relations in development initiatives. This approach considers the social relationship between the women and men, you know, assuming that women's disadvantages arise because of differences between institutions that are numerically and, more importantly, culturally male-dominated. In this approach, for example, feminist analysis of environmental management would consider how and by whom environmental management practices and policies are established and whether tools and techniques used in management favor some groups over others. 
It would also turn attention to the rules and codes of social relations that establish resource management practices and lead to differential outcomes for women and men. The challenge here is to remember that beyond gender, other dimensions of social life, such as race, ethnicity, class, and caste, also play critical roles. The privileging of gender may invoke paralysis and a simple unwillingness to engage with these dimensions as critical factors in producing social inequality. Because generally liberal feminists dominated the field of development as experts from more affluent nations, this was not an easy task, resulting in a paucity of studies that use the theory of intersectionality. Conceptually, this approach can challenge gendered categories that are used by natural resource managers by pointing out that the weaker and more marginal people have been left out from consideration. If one of the desirable outcomes of environmental management is conceived as social equity, then considering intersectional identities can offer far better equity outcomes. The challenge is that policies are usually crafted to address a single social or environmental issue, violence against women, forest management. You know, and it is not always obvious which intersections are the most important to tackle. Consequently, the policies and initiatives of sustainable development, particularly the ambitious sustainable development goals of the SDGs, designed to integrate global con consensus on tackling poverty, reducing inequality, combating climate change, and protecting the ecosystems, including oceans, forests, and biodiversity, only aimed at gendered impacts and responses. Some sustainable development initiatives even continued to target women as a homogeneous and undifferentiated social category. Researchers failed to address the question of race explicitly, eliding an engagement with race by subsuming it into the more palatable language of quote unquote difference. Finally, what is missing in this detailed and universal attempt uh, as presented by the SDGs to ameliorate environmental degradation and its negative livelihood effects on women is the question of social justice. And I will come to that in a minute. This is my going to be last theory, okay? <laughs> On this slide, I'm trying to show the differences in ownership of one of the most critical assets, land. It could be water, it could be pasture, could be seeds, fertilizers, technology, infrastructure, extension and advisory services, anything. I have chosen to look at land just to give you an idea of how things work. Throughout the world, women own considerably less land than men. In some African countries, the percentage of land owned by women is less than 10%. Globally, considering all nations and all contexts, women own just around 12% of land. Feminist research shows that this asset gap occurs due to individuals deciding on four areas, either alone or as part of a group of decision makers. This slide therefore presents a very broad way to put how to access, you know, to understand gendered access to resources. First, members of households and families. Second, members of one or several 
communities, third, residents in a country, and fourth, people whose livelihoods are generated in the presence or absence of markets. All of these play important roles. These domains are not mutually exclusive. Instead, they overlap and interact, affecting each other and the persons within. But broadly, this is how different factors influence access to land. Moving away from the household as a decision-making unit and focusing instead on how the gender identities of individuals within the household are constituted will not help us understand why rural societies and communities prioritize men's or women's access to land. Gendered access to land can provide insights into the gendered impacts of important political and economic changes, such as the individualization or, and commodification of land that's happening all around uh, the world at the moment. Considering all these allows us to extend the analysis of power at different scales <clears throat> beyond the individual to include the household, thus complicating the understanding how gender works in this private and microscopic domain. This way, we can treat gender as a critical variable in shaping resource access and control, interacting with caste, class, race, culture, and ethnicity, and so on. The processes of ecological change and the prospects for sustainable development. This way, we not only revisit gender to invigorate debates in the area at a time when social theory offers profound challenges to conventional gender and environmental approaches. This way, we can invite a vigorous analysis of gender and gendered socio-natures across multiple sites and scales within the wider political economies of natural resource governance during the extraordinary conditions of the Anthropocene. I've just dropped two bombastic words. I will explain these terms in my next slide. We are now living in the Anthropocene, where things are no longer what they used to be. Anthropocene is characterized by environmental challenges in the form of changing climates, increasing numbers, frequency, and intensity of disasters, degradation, and exhaustion of resources of extreme distress of rural communities. They have reached the tipping point. Humans today are now much more than just the homo faber, humans as makers, manipulating the natural world in the Anthropocene. They are today homo consumers, humanity, the consumers, and most importantly, they are the homo colossus, the humans who are bent on destroying exhaustible resources. One of the realities of the Anthropocene is that the environment is no longer separated from us no longer out there, you know, as something external, outside of our human domain, and only as a source of resources to extract from. We, the hum humans, collectively, have become a force of nature in the Anthropocene, a dominant force shaping the ecosystems and the climate and collapsing the separation between humans and nature. Consider for a moment the ways our societies have undermined the Earth's biophysical in integrity, deforestation, urban expansion, commercialization of agriculture, rampant ex extraction of natural resources, and industrial development. These processes are reconfiguring the delicate balance of life-sustaining systems, such as waters, 
rivers, lands, and forests. And it is not just the planet that is changing. The societies we live in are also being reshaped differently by these ecological transformations. The world has never seen, ever before, the level of inequalities between and within countries never seen so much social injustice. This intertwined relationship between humans and nature, what we call socio-nature, makes it imperative that we look at the sustainability of the world through a gender lens. The point is very simple. If our social structures and ecosystems are co-produced and entangled, then there is a need to fully appreciate the gendered anthropos. What she does, what her contributions to the economy and the society are, and the web of relationships and structures she lives within, and to put gender equality at the forefront of all our plans, policies, and actions for a more sustainable future. Social justice and gender are interconnected as both address issues of equality, rights, and access to resources. First, social justice emphasizes the fair treatment of all individuals, advocating in favor of gender equality. To put it simply, this means addressing disparities in opportunities, rights, and resources between women and men from all classes, races, and creeds, sexualities, and abilities, highlighting the extraordinary challenges that are faced by marginalized people like indigenous communities. Movements for social justice from, you know, when we look at them from feminist perspectives have pushed for policies and practices that promote women's rights and gender equality, such as reproductive rights, equal pay, and protections against gender-based violence. Social justice seeks to ensure that all individuals have access to essential resources, including education, healthcare, and employment. So why not natural resources? And I have borrowed the term everyday justice from Professor Martha Nasboom's book, Anger and Forgiveness. Um, <clears throat> the justice landscape is saturated with power, especially when we consider the urgent need to move away from coal. On this slide, you're looking at an indigenous woman who's, um, whom the Indian government sees as a criminal because she is taking coal from within the household, from within the leasehold area of a state-owned mine. Her village was displaced to make way for a large open-cut coal mine. Now, there are no trees for, left for her to collect flowers, fruits, bark, and roots from. So she now, quote unquote, collects coal from what used to be her family's ancestral land. She puts a moral claim on, that, on the coal, uh, she, although she is harassed by the police and the company's security guards. In the Anthropocene, we know that we must move away from coal to ensure that those whose livelihoods are coal-reliant we now use the concept of just transition, which is essentially a derivative of concepts of human universal rights and justice. But how can we ensure that kind of justice in a socially heterogeneous world? This woman's life is now circumscribed by coal. There is no denying it. There are no forests left. The water table has gone down and the coal dust covers the entire region. She is not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of women and men involved in similar, similar informal livelihoods. For just transition to occur, how do we see 
this evidence that represents a different kind of truth. How do we then aim to arrive at a deeper understanding of justice for those women and men living and working informally in the coal regions of the majority world? These questions bothered me greatly. When I was asked by the World Bank to write a document outlining a feminist approach to just transition. To make energy transition gender just, we cannot think about employment in the conventional sense and must take a long and hard look at the informal economy where two billion people, more than 60% of the world's employed population are earning a livelihood from. The proportion of contributing family members, quote unquote, is more than three times higher among women in informal employment as compared to men, which implies that women are doing their work as an extension of their household chores, or what um, some Marxist feminists would call social reproduction or reproductive labor. I'm coming to an end very soon of my presentation. I'll talk a little bit about the care economy. And I will use some data to explain my point because there so much could be said about the care economy. As we all know, care is an invisible, poorly recorded, poorly paid, or even unpaid part of the economy. Globally, women do three times as much unpaid care and domestic work as men. The countries in sub-Saharan Africa rely on over 900,000 community health workers to support their fragile health systems. Over two-thirds of them are women. 86% are unpaid. This must change. For too many years, we have spoken about gender equality, passed laws, and helped women's groups without achieving radical, fundamental, and transformative change. As the advisor to the UN Women, when it was developing its path-breaking feminist plan for sustainability and social justice document, I insisted that we bring these questions, questions of environmental crisis, energy transition, and social and gender justice issues together with women's contributions to livelihoods and the care economy. Cultural transformation can alter power relations between gender, enabling marginalized groups, particularly women and gender minorities, to come to the forefront. Policies, laws, and institutional practices that challenge gender inequality will follow when women get a voice. Overall, transformative, transformative change in gender will create a just and equitable society where all individuals can thrive free from discrimination and violence and where gender equality is embedded in the social fabric. <clears throat> Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy, many of you might have read it, showed that unforeseen kinds of mass politics came into existence with the advent of coal during the 18th century. A whole new world of places like mining towns, new mining communities, new politics like labor unions, and political classes where ordinary people forged political consciousness to fight for more egalitarian and democratic collective lives. Today, the Anthropocene has brought us to a similar crossroads in human history. It is for us to choose what kind of a world we want to live in, not just a new socio-technical world, but a world where our daughters and granddaughters can aim to fly high and exert their full agency, not be the recipient of burdens of environmental, ecological injustices. Without first imagining such a world, there is no way to achieve it. 
And in this room, there is no poverty of imagination. So I think we can all work together. And this is my final slide. In today's talk, I drew upon my work as a feminist researcher in rural areas of the majority world, where I learned from women toiling in agriculture as unpaid family labor, in the informal extractive economies as precarious laborers, and in managing water at home and coping with floods on an everyday basis. I stand here today representing each one of them. Every woman has a story to tell if there is someone to listen to. Each one is an extraordinary person, survivor, leader, and innovative thinker. I hope I have been able to convince you why gendered livelihoods, care, and social justice are the three keys to a possible gender equal future gender equal future world at this critical moment in the planet's history. In conclusion, I would say that as a woman, my life has been defined by many contradicting processes of giving up and dogged determination, of letting go and sticking to it, of continuous learning. I'm deeply honored by and grateful to for this inv invitation to speak here today. But I would rather stay grounded in my ordinariness, for I know in my heart that I am only one among many, many women who are making small changes in their everyday lives. All these changes are cumulatively leading up to that quantitative leap to create a better world. Thank you. Well, no surprises, I'm Andrew Phelan, so, and it's my privilege here to invite questions from the floor. I'm sure there are quite a few. We have some microphones here, by the way. Oh, just a simple one. Are you optimistic about the future? I am always optimistic. I think there are changes on the anvil. Things are happening, and uh, women's groups, for example, uh, at the moment, I'm working on how women farmers are forming self-help groups to, to deal with you know, the, some of the problems that I have described. So very slow. I would like the changes to be faster, but I think it is the responsibility for people, women like us, people like us, men and women, um, to create the world that is uh, you know, the, as I said, it's a great opportunity. Let's think of it in that way, that a decarbonized world where uh, ecological justice would be looking at everyday justice, you know, gender justice. And that is, that is my optimism. Thank you. That was a brilliant presentation. Um, you know, what struck me the most was I think your discussion around uh, the informal labour and the informal labour that uh, women are involved in and how that's not recognised, particularly in these sort of just transition uh, type um, narratives. And I guess a sort of similar question um, to the one before, but do you see any um, areas that are or organisations that are recognising that more, you know, at this point of time? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Annabelle, for that question. Yes, international labour organization is acutely aware of that. Informal economy, informal workers do not have, or you know, trade unions do not have organizations in the conventional sense. They even, in Australia, what we call as the gig economy, they are the worst, you know, most precarious. And the word precarious work came from, you know, American gig workers. And, uh, and uh, so I would say that I would say that that is under the scrutiny 
and especially um, when writing the document for the World Bank, the focus was on Global South, and even uh, you know I, the mass consultations that we carried out um, during before writing the process, uh, that document. Uh, people from South African country, South Africa. South Africa is very much like what you saw in that uh, photograph uh, in, in KwaZulu Natal. Um, men would go out and they call it doing zama zama, you know, hustle, uh, go out in the morning, pick up some coal and sell it, and that would bring them, you know, enough uh, kind of incomes. So if South Africa, which is India, is now the second largest coal producer, um, South Africa is also a very large coal producer, but the coal transition debate is more active in South Africa than in India. India is still increasing coal production. And, uh, so, and, and, and South Africa also has uh, very uh, aware, you know, um, uh, civil society actors. So Ground Truth, for example, one of them. So they are working. They, they are making sure that uh, informal uh, sector people will, do not get, you know, get neglected. But not in Europe, certainly not. That did not happen in Europe. Um, when European Bank of Reconstruction and Development was funding East German uh, women, they were putting money in the hands of miners' wives, for example, because my coal mining never had that many the women in Germany after the ILOs, you know, the ban on underground work and shift work. Yeah, so that's 1920s. So before that, Germany, of course, had Belgium, Germany, France, everywhere. Women worked in coal mines, but not after that. So they gave money, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, gave the money in the hands of uh, women, you know, minors, wives, and, you know, in the, in the community. Congratulations both on the award on the, uh, the fantastic, uh, I think very powerful presentation. Uh, I uh, have a question about, I guess, about the um, next generations and about uh, whether you think that, um, I guess, that rising expectations or rising awareness among younger generations of, of, of women are effectively going to be a catalyst for change? Uh, and does that relate to the fact that, you know, through proliferation of communications technology, people know now, and young women in so many of these countries know now uh, what, what they should have? Yeah, I, I did not mention AI and technological changes that are, you know, also on the horizon or already here in in the in the you know elephant in the room really and um, interestingly that's an that's an area where uh, your you know some work by uh, Margaret you would know Donna Haraway you know the cyborg personality and all that so the gender becomes more fluid and you know both women and men can use put it very simply really it's a very complicated uh, you know thinking that she presented. But um, in, uh, again, there is a class issue there. In, you know, the whole um, global software slaves <laughs> who come from China or uh, Russia or India, they are from the middle classes. So they are not from, uh, you know, the classes, rural, poor classes, where the majority of women are uh, working. So yes, it will benefit women, certainly, uh, because it's um, um, you know, got, uh, not that gender selective, but those kinds of work, but um, probably remain very class uh, focused. Yes. Thank you, Kuntala, for that wonderful oration, and congratulations on the award. Uh, my question is about the solution that you are proposing. So as much as I appreciate what you're saying here and I agree with what you're saying, I still find that the responsibility of addressing the challenges or the solution 
is passed on to the subaltern once again. And it's women who have to solve the problem that have been caused by men. Has there been, or are you aware of other efforts that are underway to change that rhetoric, to change that direction? Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. You're so right. You know, I, I, I am, if you have got that idea that I am passing it on to those marginalized women who, you know, they, and asking them to resistance, I think resistance, you know, there's, too, has been too much focus in social science on organized resistance. And people resist in many different ways. You know, uh, if you have read Michel de Sartou's book, you know, or Ashish Nondi, Professor Ashish Nondi's in The Intimate Enemy, you would know that often the uh, subaltern also imbibes the more powerful characteristics to be able to retaliate and resist against the more powerful. Then there are also, of course, this whole body of literature by James Scott on weapons of the weak. That also, I mean, we have thought about always that this, this is the only way people can resist. People are resisting. As I said, how would we look at women, uh, farmers, self-help groups? Let's just deal with that. I would say that it is a, they are rising themselves, but not you know, with a flag and all that, not in a very large group uh, manner, but they are resisting. Then let us come to the second part of your question that why do we expect them to always you know, resist? I think there are also changes happening in, uh, in amongst men. Uh, I'm, I, I must say it's very slow. Uh, women, and there are reasons for it. You know, the whole gender revolution was very unfinished. You know, it was stalled because women got these economic work rights, you know, became economic. They went into all fields of work, in the fields of work that belonged to men previously. But traditionally, women's work was low paid, underpaid, invisible, and men did not get into those work easily. So that's why you are seeing, and, and in Australia, if you look at it, that whole care economy is being filled up by the worst you know, immigrants, you know, the poorest immigrants and so on. So what we have to do is, that's why I could not talk a lot about, because it is more a Western uh, country problem, but it is a problem anyway for developing countries as well. I think you, you know, men will have to stand up and take care of, uh, you know, the 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 uh, the wages will have to rise. The state, when the state, when a child is born to a family, the, that family is creating the social producing labor for the future, right? It is a social act that they are doing, right? So. It, social reproduction or whatever you call it. But if the state says, I'm not going to pay child care, then the state is making a statement, right? Uh, saying something. It is saying that one of you stay at home. And it is usually the woman who stay, has to stay at home because it comes to her naturally, right? So <laughs> that is where the problem is. The, the celebration of motherhood and all the, these traditional things that we have been born into. Uh, you know, the, the concept of the ideal man, which is again very culture and class specific, but it, these things will change. They have to be changed. And men also have to take some initiative as well, you know. So it's not just uh, on women alone. State will take some initiatives. Men will take some initiative. Women are already standing up and doing stuff, OK? Namaste, Kuntaladi. As a fellow Australian Indian, I feel very proud of your achievement. Congratulations. Uh, you, you started with an example from India. And now the government has introduced various schemes. There's one called Lagpati Didi, where the women are given greater role and, you know, and uh, now with the technology, apparently the drone, uh, some messaging and 
collection of things is also being given to women. So would there be something like that, that the women can be empowered to work in this field of you know, sustainability? Would you know if something exists or would you suggest so, see, something new? If, I, if you bring my focus on India and if you let me speak, I, you know, I'm so frustrated. I will talk for too long. You're talking about a country where even today they, they claim 100% literacy, 25% women are still illiterate. You know, how can you expect them to take advantage of technology? But look at mobile phones, you know. Women are taking up technology, you know, not that they are just staying away. If the technology has to be user friendly. so. When I was working with farming women or mining women, I, one thing I found that technology was not made for, created for women. You know, the you know, farming women have to spray in the field insecticides. Those cans are 20 liters. You know, not like small five liter cans that we have in our gardens where I can use it. So they have, now that they are becoming members of self-help groups, they are becoming members of even Krishok Savas, you know, the farmers' groups. So pushing into the door, really putting their foot in the door. They will be able to make these changes, you know, they, their voices heard. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably have time for one more question. Look, if one up there. Huh? Hi, Kundala. I was in your gender and development class. Thank you. <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, I have a question about what we can do from here. So, how can we have a positive influence on the world? Uh, for example, fairer wages across the world. Has our development programs maybe changed? Can they change further? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, you have asked me that you know, big problem question in a million dollar question in GAD, gender and development. So how do we help? I think, uh, is it, you know, they, this goes to the heart of the idea of universal rights and you know, rights-based approach that we have followed so far. And we now know that this approach doesn't work because the concept of rights are different, you know, very contextual. It's just, you know, you cannot just take it lock, stock, and barrel from here and there, replicate it everywhere. So I think there is a lot for us to learn as well when we go to the field working with women. Uh, we assume that all the expertise lives with me. I'm going to give them some lecture, going to give, sorry I have done that to you as well, in the class though. <laughs> but in the field, when I'm in the field, I try to learn more. And because I'm very acutely self-conscious there as well about my presence there, because I know that I'm also different from them. You know, maybe I look pretty, very similar, but quite different, you know? So yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Well, well thank you. Um, look, the purpose of the Order of Australia Association is to celebrate and promote outstanding Australian citizenship. And I think it's very fitting that we've had with us today uh, Professor Kuntala Lahiri Dutt um, to, um, to hear about uh, this very important topic. Um, she was um, appointed an officer in the Order of Australia Order of Australia at the Australia Day 2023 list for distinguished service to natural resource management research, innovation to gender equality and tertiary education. It's a very high award, the officer of the order, um, and I think a very fitting recipient. Um, thank you uh, very much for your, for what I found to be a fascinating, uh, well-reasoned lecture on such a critical theme. Uh, delivered with great enthusiasm, dare I say, some passion, uh, which is much needed in this area. 
Uh, you've translated a wealth of learning and research. Uh, I, I had the privilege of actually seeing an earlier transcript of this, and it caused me to spend hours and hours just, just, just to, to delve behind it to see what was summarised in this most uh, engaging way. And it came across as very understandable and meaningful, I think, to, to all of us. As you've noted, um, we're now living in the Anthropocene, another word I had to learn, uh, where things are no longer what they used to be and what is characterised by environmental challenges that have reached tipping point. If I can quote you, you rightly say, it is for us to choose what kind of world we want to live in. Not just a new socio-technical world, but a world where our granddaughters can aim to fly high and exert their full agency not be the recipient of burdens of injustices. Without first imagining such a world, there is no way to achieve it. I like to think that uh, uh, Kuntala has, has given us a way in which we can start to imagine that world, those of us who might not have thought through all of the issues that you've raised today. You mount a very convincing case to me about why gendered livelihoods, care and social justice are the three keys to a possible and gender equal future world at this critical moment in the planet's history. A sustainable world, the word that comes over and over, a sustainable world uh, built on gender equality. And this interwined relationship between humans and nature makes it imperative that we look at the sustainability of the world through a gender lens. So thank you for the very many ways in which you continue to uh, help improve the lives of women and societies throughout the world. And I think your career also highlights the importance of geography uh, and its inherent multidisciplinary approach to researching and understanding complex human systems. I know you've moved on from base concepts of that, but it was something that I actually studied before I did law uh, to honours level. And I, in fact, there's a fellow pupil here, a former professor, um, in the audience here, uh, Catherine Gibson. Um, I studied with her. Um, I'd like to uh, echo your comments up front, uh, the appreciation of the ANU environment, which has enabled you and many others, including our three children, uh, to contribute meaningfully to society and the world in general. So on behalf of all of us here, could I once again thank you uh, for your excellent presentation and invite everyone to show your appreciation in the usual way. And, and there is a, a little gift to signify. Well, thank you. As well. Uh, could I also thank the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Genevieve Bell, for her support and and uh, her predecessors too for, for this lecture series, and Professor Janine O'Flynn, Director, Crawford School of Public Policy, College of Asia, Asia and the Pacific Australian National University for introducing us so well. And finally, could I please thank the ANU event team who have done a wonderful job yet again. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>